You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 38 of the Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. For this episode, we have the utmost pleasure in interviewing Kevin Gover. Kevin is currently the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, a position he has held since 2007. He is also the acting undersecretary for museums and culture. Mr. Gover is a tribal citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and descendant of the Comanche Nation. If you're guessing that Kevin and I are related due to the similarity in our last names, you are correct. Mr. Kevin Gover is my elder first cousin. Kevin, thank you so much for agreeing to be on our podcast. It is a pleasure to have you. You're welcome. Thank you. Of course. And for those listening, Kevin is the Gover that mostly everyone knows. And I often get asked uh, about our relatedness when I'm introduced to new people. And uh, maybe one day someone will ask him if he knows me. That's the goal. Well, that's going to happen. You know, there are places where I'm I'm Phil Gover's dad or David Gover's cousin, and now there'll be a whole bunch of people. I'll be Carlton Gover's cousin. So that's how it works. There we go. Absolutely. And this isn't the first time that my co-host, uh, David and Connor, have had an interaction with Kevin. We actually, Kevin hosted us at the Smithsonian during the Society of American Archaeology Conference held in D.C. And it was great to just sit down and, and chat with Kevin and have some coffee and talk about the museum. So we want to kind of have an extension of that experience today. And so we've had a lot of listeners and followers on our social media. They've wanted to get more information on a diversity of backgrounds. And so we wanted to ask you, Kevin, what were your early experiences growing up as an indigenous person? Because you're both Pawnee and Comanche. And as we said in your intro, you're a citizen of the Pawnee Nation, but uh, Comanche descendant. So I was kind of curious, did you have to choose between which nation you had to be a citizen of and kind of what was your experience growing up? Yeah, no, I, I didn't really get to choose. Um, my dad was enrolled Pawnee, and I don't know why he was Pawnee instead of Comanche. You know, I really grew, I grew up down in Lawton, Oklahoma, and that's, uh, that's where the Comanches are. So I knew many more of my Comanche relatives for, during my, my young life than I did my Pawnee relatives. So, but I, you know, I always knew I was a Pawnee citizen and I didn't devote a lot of thought to why Pawnee instead of Comanche. You know, there was a point back when the Indian Claims Commission judgments were coming out and, you know, Indians were getting uh, a share of the settlement monies for that, that uh, I had the opportunity to enroll as, as Comanche in order to participate in their judgment fund. But I, I really didn't see the point of that. So, you know, I'm a Pawnee. So it wasn't for the uh, sweet $12 annuity check we get every year from the Pawnee Nation? <laughs> yeah, I call it my Christmas pizza check, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Carlton had referred to you as an Arari. Uh, would you mind explaining what that is? It's a, it's a, cousin, a cousin or a brother, I suppose. Okay. And I know in indigenous culture or um, specifically in Pawnee culture, like cousin and brother might be a little more synonymous than it is in, you know, Germanic culture like we have? Would you mind explaining that a little bit? Oh, I, I think you just did. Um, you know, if we uh, we think of our, uh, my uncles are also my fathers. My uh, great uncles are also my my grandfather. So that that's sort of the way the tribe is. So my cousins are my brothers and sisters, of course. And, and growing up in Northern Virginia, I didn't understand that dichotomy. And, and Kevin's is my senior by, I think, like, 20 something cousins in between us. I, I remember growing up, me and my younger brother had a, a difficulty in understanding that Kevin was our cousin. So growing up, we used to just call him Uncle Kevin. Right. I think it just drove my dad up the wall, but it, it was, I think it was fine. But it was really later in life, I was like, oh, we're cousins. And it was kind of one of those, just one <laughs> of those moments that we had. Um, and then uh, Kevin was one of growing up, the, the closest relative that I had on my, on my dad's side, because he was working on um, you work. What we'll get to that later working for the department of the interior being so close where my, where my father also worked. So you have a background, you went to, I want to say Princeton. i have my notes up right next to me and I know it, it was Princeton. Princeton. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what drove you to go get your education, your, your under, your undergraduate at, uh, at Princeton? 
Oh, you know, I always knew I was going to college. I mean, that was that was the ethic in, in my family. My parents always told me, you know, work hard in school so you can get into a good college. And somehow I had heard of Harvard, you know, and so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go to Harvard, by golly. So what happened is when I was uh, 15, I was introduced to a young lawyer. He was a, a VISTA volunteer. That was one of the social programs of the 60s. And he worked uh, at Americans for Indian Opportunity, uh, which is where my dad worked. And uh, this, this young lawyer, his name was Seymour Preston IV. There's another name in there, but I can never remember it. Seymour something Preston IV. But Seymour was this real nice fella. And he had gone to a prep school in Concord, New Hampshire. So long story short, with, uh, with, with Seymour's help, I ended up going to St. Paul's School in, in Concord, New Hampshire, one of the New England preps. From there, if you went to St. Paul's, you were sort of expected to go to an Ivy League school. So I did. And uh, I chose Princeton really for no better reason than a number of my friends from St. Paul's were going there, some of my closest friends. And I wanted to be someplace where I knew where I knew people. So I went to Princeton instead of Harvard. And uh, there was really no rhyme or reason to it. It's not like I studied the curriculum or made any kinds of uh, meaningful judgments about my future career path. I just did it because that's where my buddies were. How were your first years at Princeton, you know, being an indigenous person? Did you have some unique experiences there as part of that? <laughs> well, they they weren't too good, I've got to say. You know, this was, uh, you guys are way too young, but... When I uh, entered Princeton, September 73, in May of 73, they had graduated their first class that had women in it. So even co-education was new then. And so they, they had made some efforts to recruit minority students, as had St. Paul's. But they knew how to find us and bring us there. They didn't really know how to keep us there and how to, how, what we needed to be comfortable in that environment. And we didn't know either, you know, we were all, you know, it was a one grand experiment in seeing if you could diversify a very, very staid, old, you know, hidebound uh, university that was very stuck in its ways. So I, I immediately felt very much the outsider at Princeton in ways that I hadn't at St. Paul's. So it was a struggle, and I would never reveal my college transcripts because they're too embarrassing. But let's just say I, I didn't thrive at Princeton. I survived Princeton. That's fascinating in a number of different ways. So how many other Indigenous students were with you during Princeton? I think uh, at, at, at high tide, there were 12, 13, maybe 14 of us. By the time I left, there were only a couple and over the course of those years, only about half of us graduated. And it was, was it just due to the kind of environment that was present for indigenous students there? Were you guys treated differently or, or I don't imagine it being like the academic rigor that was the causality for, for the dropout, but more of kind of social pressure? Yeah, I wouldn't even call it pressure. It was more of a, it was just so unfamiliar and so alien you know, they some of these kids were coming in straight from reservation schools or from, you know, public high schools in New Mexico or Arizona. It was just really tough for them. Some of us came from, there were, what, I think three of us from uh, from preps, and we managed to get through. But, uh, you know, if, it, if we hadn't had each other, those close friendships, I, I don't know that any of us would have made it. So, you know, it, it wasn't an overt hostility but it was, uh, it's, it's difficult to describe. It was just that we, we felt we didn't belong there. And it wasn't, you were with other indigenous folks, but you weren't from the same nation or no. other. So you're, you're kind of exposed and kind of thrown together. Yeah, it, we really were from all over. I mean, I remember there was a Seneca guy, there was an Alaska native a couple of my best friends were Navajos, a couple of Pueblo guys. And so we, we were we were from all over. And so you received um, a degree in public and international affairs. Were you like undecided when you first got there? Or you kind of just felt like this is where you wanted to go from that, from the onset? 
I don't know, by the time I was in fifth grade, I think I wanted to be a lawyer. And so um, uh, college was something you had to do in order to go to law school, which is something you had to do in order to be a lawyer. So that that's really how I thought about college. So, but, I, you know, I did have an interest in politics and policy and, you know, what was then the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs was one of the great places for undergraduate study of policy and politics. So, you know, I was I was grateful for that. And I did I did learn a lot despite my um, unhappiness. I really found that to be useful later in life. Uh, they they changed the name of the school just well, I think it was last summer. And finally, so it's no longer the um, the Woodrow Wilson School. It's now just the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. And what was our our family's reaction to your acceptance and, and membership at Princeton? Well, I guess you know I, I, they were happy about it. I mean, you know how it is. You know you, um, how we we sort of. Uh, raise our kids up and um, and brag about them. So I got bragged about a lot, even though they didn't really didn't know what it meant to be at Princeton or what that was like for me, that I was always getting introduced. This is Kevin. He goes to Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I go, yeah, yeah, I go to Princeton, you know. So it was fine. You know, they, they were, they were always good to me. The family was always good to me, but you know, there there is a downside that I thought about, Carlton, and that is um, the family, though, can also kind of take your accomplishments and claim them. You know what I mean? So that they're yeah. not really yours. They're theirs as much as they are yours. And I'm like, yeah, no, not really. I'm the one doing this. So, you know, back up. <laughs> Got you. And so you always knew you went, you wanted to get into law. So you had to, had to go to law school afterwards. So you went to the University of New Mexico's law program. Was there like a, a gap between Princeton and UNM or was it just kind of sh- straight there continuing your school? Man, it was straight there. You know, at UNM, they ran this great program, uh, the uh, uh, Summer Pre-Law Institute for American Indian Students. I went to the pre-law institute not knowing I would end up at the University of New Mexico, but I liked it so much that, um, you know, when the opportunity came, I just said, yeah, I'm going to stay here. This is great. I really, I loved Albuquerque. I loved being in New Mexico. It was nice to be um, in a place where there were other brown people around and that, you know, that uh, it was just a very comfortable place for me to go to school. And so I was really happy that, that I ended up there. I'm I'm glad that you found a place that you felt a part of. And one of the most vivid experiences I remember as part of us meeting way back in the day, whenever it was in Washington, D.C., is that you told us this really interesting story of your experience at at a Princeton football game, how that kind of personified this weirdness that you felt um where you were sitting you know you know sitting in the sidelines feeling weird about this do you mind telling that again i think you're talking about the rutgers game yeah right? so yes so, so princeton and rutgers played the very first intercollegiate football game back in you know 20 bc or something i don't remember what the date was <laughs> But and so, you know, me and my my Navajo buddies, uh, Roman Bitsui and Larry Nez, we were all freshmen and we're out there. And and at Princeton, you know, football's it's kind of a big deal, but not really. I mean, it's not like they have great football teams in the Ivy League, but um, it was sort of an event. It's it's what you did. And they have all sorts of traditions around it. They have these goofy fight songs. And and so we're, we're sort of bemused the whole time. So what happened is uh, Princeton almost always lost to Rutgers. Rutgers, you know, is a 1A school and Princeton is an Ivy League school. So they, they couldn't really compete. But that particular year, Princeton played them close. And it came down to the end and uh, Rutgers was ahead six to nothing. And so lo and behold, with seconds left, Princeton scores a touchdown. Well, it turned out before Princeton scored its touchdown, the Rutgers fans had run onto the field and torn down the goalpost at both ends of the stadium. Oh my so goodness. now Princeton has tied the game, but they can't kick they can't <laughs> kick an extra point, right? And, and so 
So then, uh, so Princeton has to go, you know, the refs wouldn't let him replace the goalpost. They said, no, you got to go for two. So they went for two. They failed. So the game ends in a 6-6 tie. But the, the crazy thing was that then all these white kids from both schools run out onto the field and they start fighting each other. And, and we're sitting up there in the stands kind of, kind of watching this going, what, on, what the hell is this? You know? and, uh, and, you know, we'd had a little bit to drink, so that made it particularly amusing. And, and the cops are out there just whacking people with sticks. <laughs> so there's this little mini riot, Ivy League riot. It was very polite, of course. So and anyway... That that's what happened at our first Princeton football game, and so <laughs> it's like it was crazy. Wow, what an experience! So that's the end of the first quarter. We'll be back with uh, Kevin's experiences at UNM and start getting into uh, some some law work that Kevin participated in back in the day. So we'll be right back. Hey guys, welcome back to segment two of a Life and Earth podcast. We're here with Kevin Gover, related to Carlton. The better Gover, we're <laughs> uh, we're going to talk today. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, Mr. Gover's work with the Federal Service, and then you work at the Smithsonian. So I guess we wanted to start it off. So we left off with your 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 law school uh, work. Did you work in any high profile law cases at all? Oh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know about high profile. You know, we we did a couple of things. Actually, my first job out of law school was uh, clerking for a federal judge there in Albuquerque, Juan Bursiaga. Judge Bursiaga got um, a couple of interesting cases that I that I uh, uh, clerked him on. One was um, back then the universities of Oklahoma and Georgia sued the NCAA because at that time there were only two college football games a week on television. That was it, and the NCAA had made a contract with uh, the network and uh, the teams uh, split the revenue, and so it wasn't all that much. And so Oklahoma and Georgia sued, saying that NCAA was price fixing and in violation of the antitrust laws. So Judge Bersiaga and I go to Oklahoma to hear the case. All the Oklahoma judges had to recuse themselves from the case because they all had season tickets to Oklahoma football (laughs) games. And so they needed another judge from within the circuit, but outside the state. And so Judge Bersiaga got the call. And so we go over there, we try this case. In the end, you know, it was, it was really clear as it could be. And so the judge ruled that, uh, that, yes, in fact, the NCAA was price fixing and, and, uh, and invalidated their contract with, uh, at that time, it was ABC, I think. So long story short, the case goes uh, up to the circuit court, the circuit court affirms, then it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court affirmed. And that is why we have 837 college football games every weekend to choose from. So I didn't, obviously, I just was a clerk on that, but I, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. Another was a, a redistricting case in New Mexico where the legislature had drawn new legislative districts for the state. And they had really rather badly gerrymandered and diluted the um, uh, Hispanic and Native American vote in the state. And so uh, Judge Bersiaga was one of three judges who heard the case. They struck down the redistricting law and uh, drew new districts that really empowered both the Hispanic population, but especially the Indians. And as a result of that, a record number of Indians were elected to the legislature, and there's still a large number of natives uh, in the New Mexico legislature. So that uh, that was also a lot of fun. Uh, as for my practice, you know, we did a lot of cases. There was only one that ended up in the Supreme Court, and it was a water rights case out of Wyoming, actually, the uh, the Bighorn case. My firm was representing the Shoshone tribe, and although I did not argue to the court, my partner Susan Williams did. We all uh, participated in the, you know, in the strategy and the practical arguments and in writing the briefs. So, you know, I got exposed to a lot of uh, really great lawyering early on when I worked at the Freed Frank Law Firm in Washington, D.C. And my, uh, my bosses were uh, Rick West, who was the first director of the National Museum of the American Indian, and uh, Art Lazarus, who was one of the, um, uh, he was actually a protege of Felix Cohen. And Felix Cohen quite literally wrote the book on federal Indian law in the uh, early 40s. 
so in in a sense, you know, we were inheriting the uh, the knowledge uh, that came from Cohen to Lazarus to Rick Rick West, and and I saw some uh, some really I just uh, learned a lot of good habits from from working for lawyers of that quality. So two things I can put your name in the the blame jar for why I don't do anything on Saturdays now because you, you know, <laughs> you, you put on all 837 football games. Right. Um, I'll, I'll make sure and tell my wife that, but <laughs> it seems like you were um, at a, you know, early within your career, you're exposed to folks who are at least big in the field of um, indigenous law and, and things like that. How did that kind of shape your career? Oh, it meant everything. I mean, the best way for a young lawyer to learn is watching good lawyers work. And, and I did. So, you know, it, it, it means everything. I got I was, uh, in essence, an apprentice and got to uh, got to watch and see how it's done at a very high level. You know, even at our little law firm then that we formed in New Mexico later, we just maintain a very high standard of quality. You know, good enough wasn't good enough for us because we all had trained with lawyers like that. And you you started this practice, Gover, Stetson, and Williams in Albuquerque in 96, right? Or 86, sorry. Yeah, 86. So you got to watch the Native American Graves Protections and Repatriations Act kind of unfold, right? But you weren't directly part of that case, correct? That's right. As NAGPRA was, was going on, what were kind of your views and attitudes as, as a lawyer watching other indigenous lawyers work out this case? You know, there, there weren't that many of us. We all kind of knew each other and or at least were aware of each other, even if we'd never met. And there were so many issues that, that required attention at that time that, you know, you, you ended up, interestingly enough, kind of specializing and so, you know, my firm uh, worked with gaming, we worked with water rights, we worked with environmental law and some, some business transactions. But there were other firms and really led by the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder who were doing the uh, cultural resources work and, and doing a fine job of it. So I wasn't deeply involved in it, but, uh, you know, you can't do everything. And so when you know that, that an issue is being well managed by somebody else you you let them do it and just try to back them up when they need it gotcha and and you mentioned that you you did indian gaming work for for that did you work on any cases or or movements um, behind american indian gaming yeah well you know gaming sort of swept the country and we weren't uh our, our clients weren't the first to get involved in it but once they did they were very aggressive and uh, they they really sort of oh, how would you say they 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 pushed really hard uh, sometimes beyond the parameters of the statute that governs Indian gaming. So our work was partly litigation, where frankly we lost a lot. But then it became political, where we had to go to the state legislatures, and there we tended to win a lot. So yeah, we did a lot of gaming work. Everybody was doing gaming work, you know, in the in the uh, mid '80s through uh, through mid '90s. And what was the result of this work that you guys did? Well, we won a lot. We ended up with uh, you know all of our clients um, operating very profitable gaming enterprises. You know, it, it really changed everything when the tribes began to generate that kind of uh, money. That was, you know, not subject to any federal controls um, that was really theirs to spend as they wished. And you can see the changes all over Indian country. You know, when I got in the business in the early 80s, we were doing things like negotiating self-determination contracts with the Bureau of Indian Affairs or um, uh, fighting with HUD or trying to get HUD to give uh, give the tribe uh, a few more houses in their housing in, uh, for their housing authority. And that sort of thing, you know, by the time I, I essentially stopped practicing in 1997 and we were negotiating, you know, transactions worth many millions of dollars, usually centered around gaming, but not just gaming. So and, and to see the changes in those communities, you know, when I grew up in Oklahoma, I knew there were a lot of Indians around, you know, because I, I knew a lot of them and my parents were friends with a lot of different people. But the tribes as sort of as entities were, were all but invisible. 
you know, they just weren't a part of, uh, of the daily awareness of most people in Oklahoma. Well, you go there now and the tribes are everywhere. They're very visible and they're, they're, um, they're on the news. They're just everywhere. Their presence is, is very noticeable in almost every endeavor in Oklahoma. And, and, and frankly, it's mostly because of gaming because that gave them the seed money they needed to start doing all the other things they wanted to do. So it was revolutionary. As a friend of mine once said, it has the, uh, the, the Indian gaming policy has the virtue of being the only federal economic development policy for Indians that actually worked. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And, you know, at some point you got a job uh, working for the U.S. government, working as the assistant secretary for Indian affairs for the U.S. Department of the Interior. Did this kind of work in the gaming area kind of propel you to that point? It was partly the gaming, but I, I, I just built a good reputation as a lawyer. I was a good lawyer. My clients, they did it right when they were pursuing something, even a controversial project. They were reasonable and they were well organized and they uh, and well regulated, and so that was sort of the reputation our firm had for how we how we did our work. I came to the attention of Bruce Babbitt, who was the Secretary of the Interior at the time, through a case we were working in in uh, California, where a tribe wanted to use its uh, reservation lands for a municipal landfill, a commercial municipal landfill. Well, we had gone through all sorts of uh, work to develop these regulatory codes and regulatory capacities so that um, we really literally had a, an environmental protection agency in this little tribe in California. They had a lot of experts working for them, and uh, we were writing regulatory codes for them. And the case ended up on Babbitt's desk because we needed a lease approved. So, you know, I sent the department a couple of letters, and I guess... Uh, Secretary Babbitt read one of them and, and was impressed. So when I met him, when uh, we took the tribe to see the secretary, he took me aside and, and uh, said something to that effect, that he thought the letter was was very good. And then a couple of years later, he started talking to me about would I be willing to come to Interior and be the assistant secretary. And uh, at first I, I demurred and said, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I just, I don't know about that. But as I thought about it, I realized that, you know, when you have that opportunity to try to do something good, you, you really don't have a choice but to take it if you're a committed advocate uh, to the tribes. So as the head of Bryu of the Indian Affairs, as, you know, assistant secretary to the Indian Interior, you know, two of the most mismanaged agencies in, in federal government, as I was always told, are the, are the BIA and Indian Health Services, IHS. So being indigenous yourself, coming in as, you know, the head of the BIA, what was your attitude? Like, what were you trying to change or do as, in that role? Well, I was trying to do everything, I guess. You know, the, the Bureau, there's never a day when uh, you're at the Bureau that you come into the office and get your coffee and sit down and, and your deputy comes in and says, you know, everything's going great today. There are no problems <laughs> in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. <laughs> so it was a lot of problem solving. But what I wanted to show most was that the Bureau was, in fact, quite capable when given the resources it needs and given the authorities it needs to carry out its assignments, it can be very effective. But the problem is that, um, you know, Congress keeps giving the Bureau more to do, but then they don't bring the money with it. And so everything is ends up being kind of half-assed, you know, where there, there are just not enough resources to do what you know ought to be done in order to do it right. And so it becomes um, a series of quick fixes where, you, you know, you put out one fire, put out another fire. And there's, there's, there's really not the opportunity for a real cogent sort of planning effort or the opportunity to carry out a program for more than a couple of years when, you know, the, the kinds of changes that the Bureau needs take a decade at least. And there, it, it just wasn't, there, there just wasn't that kind of opportunity. So 
Uh, but I do think, you know, we, we reinvigorated the Bureau. You know, the staff was, uh, morale was, was just in the toilet when I got there. They had just gone through a, a tremendous reduction in force where a bunch of people lost their jobs. And they, they really looked and acted like a bunch of survivors, you know, shipwreck survivors. And so I do feel like I was able to re-energize them and, and, uh, and to show people the kind of good work they were capable of. Gotcha. And, and kind of two, two questions here. You know, what was, what was the reaction of my dad when all of a sudden you were his boss? And then the <laughs> second one, we kind of want to talk about um, the Cobell case and, and kind of on behalf of the federal government arguing against Indians for um, this claim that the U.S. government owed indigenous nations a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Well, your dad was very supportive, you know, from the beginning. He, he was really invaluable to me. And I always had somebody I could talk to when... I wasn't sure uh, who I could trust. And uh, so, you know, I will will always be grateful to George for that. Um, And he was just enough distant from, you know, from where I was in terms of the, you know, the the bureaucracy that um, uh, we could we could sort of keep a distance, you know, in 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 the building. But then, you know, when we were at our house or at your house, we could talk about these things. So it was good. As for Cobell, well, Cobell's a great example of that phenomenon I was telling you about. Congress gave the Bureau all these responsibilities for the management of these lands and the, and the money they generated, but never really properly funded it. And so, you know, I was reading some, um, some reports from the 1930s where the Bureau was sending up flares saying this system is going to crash. It's going to crash. It's too much. They're, you know, it's too complicated. We need help. And Congress just ignored it for 60 years. And then in the 90s, they suddenly get interested and say, geez, Bureau, you really screwed this up. Um, And well, it was Congress. Congress participated in the neglect of the uh, of the trust program. And so, yeah, it was a mess. It was on the verge of collapse. And so Congress ordered a series of reforms and, and actually this time backed it up with some money. And so a lot of major reforms were made. And ultimately, the Cobell case ended up with a judgment of, I think, $2 billion or thereabouts to the individual Indians who, who owned trust lands. I, you know, I, ironically, um, I was suing myself in that case because as a, as a, <laughs> I had inherited part of our, our uh, Uppets allotment. And so I was an account holder and I was being sued by the account holders. So... <laughs> you know, Indian Indian law is just weird stuff. It's just always weird. I think I only get an eighth of an acre out of that allotment. Yeah, and you can't and you can't have it. You can you can you can have a, a what an, an inchoate interest in that property, but none of us could go out there and say, "Well, I'll take this," you know, thirty yards of it, because it's just not allowed. That's how stupid the system is. So we all own land, but we can't have it. Yep. And then, so the result of the Cobell case, for those that don't know, there's the Cobell scholarship. So it's it's for indigenous peoples. Um, it's it's scholarship money for education. That's kind of what a lot of that money got got used for. And it's very beneficial to a lot of indigenous people who want to go to college to have the Cobell to to fund them. So with that, I was going to make like a bell joke. That's the ring of the bell. Time to end the segment, but I don't think I will. So we'll uh, we'll be back with Kevin Gover here for segment three here in a moment. Hey there, entrepreneurs. What's the easiest choice you can make? Outsourcing tasks you hate. What about selling with Shopify? (laughs) Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. With their all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average. Plus, you can sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. I love how Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dax, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash dax now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash dax. Welcome back to episode 38 of a Life in Ruins podcast. We are interviewing the awesome, the venerable Kevin Gover here on this podcast. This is the third session and we wanted to start off the session because you have, at least from my perspective, 
you have a sweet gig. You have a sweet job right now. And we wanted to ask you about that job and how you how you got into it. Yeah, it is a sweet gig. I think, you know, sort of cosmically, it's my reward for having agreed to be the assistant secretary for Indian affairs for three years. <laughs> and and one that was entirely unexpected. You know, I was in the in the mid 2000s um, teaching law at Arizona State University. I'd sort of given up the practice of law and was uh, was teaching there, was part of the Indian legal program at that university, which is producing a bunch of great young lawyers. I'm, I'm really proud of them. And minding my own business, you know, and I kind of felt like I, I was put out to pasture and I was okay with that. You know, I was just, you know, sort of minding my own business and, and uh, enjoying not having all that much to do. And so that was, that was a sweet gig. And um, these headhunters from the Smithsonian called, said, we, you know, We'd like you to, to uh, put in an application to run the National Museum of the American Indian. Well, my former law partner, Rick West, as I mentioned earlier, had been the, uh, the first director of the NMAI. And so it wasn't preposterous that a lawyer could run a Smithsonian Museum. On the other hand, it's, it wasn't ideal either. And so I, I sort of pondered and asked, are you sure you, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I, uh, I like museums fine, but I don't have any experience with museums. And they said, well, you know, you've got, you've got an interesting background. So why don't you, why don't you, you know, send us a resume and we'll, we'll talk. So then I went through, gosh, at least four interviews round by round, you know, the committee would reduce the number of contestants. It was like, uh, either The Bachelor or uh, Survivor, you know, where uh, <laughs> one by one, you know, you'd see them fall away and we'd, we'd bid these candidates goodbye. Actually, we never knew who else had applied. The, these search firms are very sophisticated in, in uh, keeping you away from each other. But, you know, after, you know, probably after the second or third interview, I started thinking, you know, I, I think I can do this. And, uh, and not only that, I think I really want to do this. So I was delighted when uh, the secretary chose me to, um, to run the NMAI. As I thought about it later, I think what they liked about my credentials was, first of all, I had federal executive experience. And so, which means, you know, I, I knew how to do things and, and most importantly, to keep my agency out of trouble. I knew how to follow the rules and, and just do all the things that uh, federal agencies have to do. Even though we're not technically a federal agency, we're subject to a lot of the same rules. Second, I did have, you know, some chops as a scholar because I, you know, I wrote about federal Indian law. And uh, so, you know, I, I was I was credible as a, as a, as a scholar. But I think what really won the day was that the Smithsonian, because it's so far flung, really needs somebody to manage their relationship with, uh, with the tribes. And I know a lot of Indians and I know a lot of the leadership and always have. And so it was clear that I was a person who could manage their relationship with the tribes and, and develop a good relationship with the tribes. And, and in fact, that's how it's turned out. You know, I think that there's just a lot of goodwill for the NMAI uh, in Indian country and therefore for the Smithsonian. And that, despite the fact that, you know, the Smithsonian, uh, let's say 40 years ago, uh, was not well loved in Indian country. And uh, Indian country did not appreciate the way that the Smithsonian presented Native American material. And they resented the hell out of uh, the Smithsonian uh, holding on to all of these Native American human remains. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that because, yeah, well, in, in general, historically, museums and indigenous folks in North, North America have not gotten along mainly on the problem uh, on the side of museums, you know, obviously, like you mentioned, hoarding or having all this, um, this, these artifacts that are associated with the indigenous folks of North America. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because, and I'm glad that relationship is at least repairing a little bit as things are going forward. So, you know, 
I'm just going to say as a, as a white person, thank you um, for, <laughs> for helping to resolve those working with tribes now, because that's, that's the step that needs to go, you know, going forward that needs to happen. Yeah. Well, that, that work was well underway before I arrived. And that was really the, the core philosophy of the National Museum of the American Indian was we are not the experts. Uh, the native people themselves are the experts. And so we call upon them for how we should address and present their cultures and histories. You know, it was not unheard of, but it was, it was fairly revolutionary at the time. And the museum took a lot of criticism for it, too. Um, but now I think if you look around, uh, you'll find very few museums and, and really none of the major museums uh, would dare to put on an exhibition without uh, consultation and cooperation with uh, Native American artists or Native American community leaders. Yeah, and kind of kind of going off that relationship, you talked about, you know, Vine Deloria in his, in his work, Custer Died for Your Stins, and talking about museums and anthropologists says, you know, behind each policy and program with which Indians are plagued, if traced back completely to its origin, stands the anthropologist. So the deep-seated you know, you're really kind of talking about some deep seated mistrust of museum institutions and anthropologists. And, but as you said, you know, we've kind of since NAGPRA 1990, I think we've come a, a long way in restoring that trust that I, that definitely I can, we can owe part of your leadership at, as the director of the American, of the American Indian Museum. As Yeah. A, well, you know, NAGPRA and the NMAI Act was the first repatriation law, actually, it passed before NAGPRA and required the Smithsonian to engage in, in, in repatriation of human remains and later uh, sacred objects and cultural patrimony. But, but I think what all of Museum World learned from watching the NMAI and the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian is that what repatriation really does, it doesn't result in a pillaging of the collection, which is what everybody was so worried about. Um, but what happens instead is you form this really productive bilateral relationship with the tribe. And because the tribe can teach us about these collections more than we can teach them. And we, in turn, can, um, can provide uh, expertise on conservation, on the repair of these items, on, uh, on how, to, how to present them effectively. And so uh, we have a very active uh, uh, tribal museum lending program where we want to send as much of this material back into the communities as possible. Now, you know, when you engage with the Smithsonian, you know, you're going to end up in a bear hug and that's just the way it is because it's so big and we have so many rules. And so the requirements for, for borrowing objects from the Smithsonian are formidable, but really come down to environmental controls and security. But if you can do that, then we want this material back in their home communities. And, and we've had some success in, in, returning things, even, you know, even though they're not um, subject to repatriation, we still want them back in those communities and being cared for there. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with uh, regulations and repatriations or, or long-term loan loans of artifacts by the yeah. Smithsonian because yeah. like, working with the Pawnee Museum and trying to get this new cultural center, me and Matt Reed, our, our TIPO and who has a background in museums, like are constantly having to tell architects and kind of what we're doing with this museum like we have to have this hvac this way we have to have the loading docks this way because there's a standard in which the smithsonian operates that's kind of holistic to what everyone else needs in order to get these things back so that's why we need this money here and that's why we need these sophisticated environmental controls right uh, which people aren't necessarily aware of because surprisingly putting your museum in an old piggly wiggly is just not up to <laughs> Smithsonian standards. So, um. so David, you deal with kind of um, NAGPRA collections and, and and museum stuff, and you're currently dealing with the, the COVID nineteen outbreak. Can you talk about David? Can you talk about your experience with that right now? How is that going for you? Me? Yeah, I mean it's it's different. The lab is like spaced out with. Uh, we got to distance people six feet at their stations. Normally, like if you're curating stuff, like we have people grab, you know, bags or pencils or uh, counters like from, you know, like a shelf. But now we like have them just take it to their desks and stuff. We got to wear masks. Um, it's interesting, but we haven't had any 
the biggest change is not having anybody from the public like come into the lab per se because it's a laboratory setting so i'm curious to know like in a museum where it is you know based on public outreach like how how's that going there well not so well the smithsonian museums are closed as we speak we we had opened several of the museums over the summer we we first closed in in march when it became clear that the outbreak was out of control and i think it was like the day after they announced that they weren't going to play the ncaa basketball tournament uh, then the smithsonian closed as did all the other museums in in washington and uh, we remained closed until i think late july and we opened uh, the National Zoo, and we opened the Air and Space Museum out at uh, out at the Dulles Airport um, because they're very large and more open, and you know less of a possibility of uh, spread. But we had all the same protocols. We had required social distancing. We required the guests to wear masks. We kept our attendance to no more. We actually went to a ticketing system for the first time. Um, the tickets were free, but you had to have a ticket to come in. And we would only issue uh, tickets up to about 25% of capacity so that we could maintain social distancing throughout the, the museum. That makes sense. And that, that worked fairly well. And we were able to open um, the African American Museum, the American History Museum, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, National Portrait Gallery, and then finally the uh, National Museum of the American Indian. And they stayed open for, oh gosh, about two months, a little more than that. But then with uh, as the cases began to rise again this fall, uh, both nationally and here in our region, we just couldn't see a way to, uh, to keep them open and keep the visitors and the staff safe. So, uh, so we're closed at the moment and uh, unlikely to open again before, well, the end of January at least. Right. For the museum and its, and its exhibitions, how far out do you guys plan ahead? Years. Years. Yeah, our exhibition schedules are blown up. They're just, you know, they're out the window because, um, you know, both of the exhibitions we develop ourselves, we can continue to work for the most part, but not in the buildings. We can't actually build exhibitions right now. We can do a lot of the research and, and other work, but we can't we can't build other exhibitions, you know, travel around the country and may go to three or four different museums. So we have a Preston Singletary show that was scheduled for... Um, for now, I think, actually, uh, that then got moved to next summer. And we don't know, but that it'll have to move again. So exhibition schedules have just blown up. Now, on the flip side, the upside of all of this is the Smithsonian finally had to crawl its way out of the 19th century and start to really do a lot of good work online. Now, we had an online presence and we were doing this and a little bit of that and, you know, the other the, the pandemic forced us to move huge amounts of our content onto online platforms. And lo and behold, you know, we actually can do that pretty well. And so I think it's, it's basically it's going to change the Smithsonian forever and that you will see an ongoing focus on our online work and activity and product even more than you will in the museums themselves. That's good to hear. And we've realized that and, it, you know, it's going to sound silly and obvious, but we've realized we can reach many, many, many more people online than we can in our museums. And I think everybody always knew that. You, 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 how could you not know it? But it's a tough, it's a stark realization for an institution this old that has always um, been all about bringing people in to see these wonderful objects that we have. And so it's it's going to it, it's it's mildly traumatic, I think, for a lot of people at the Smithsonian to think that, you know, our greatest impact is no longer going to be on visitors who actually enter our physical spaces. And then instead, you know, we've got to find a new way to uh, to deliver con content and have influence. So I, I have two questions for you. One, when will there ever be an exhibit that features more Pawnee objects? And two, what has changed with your role as the acting undersecretary for museums and culture? Well, we, it, it, it'll disappoint you to learn we don't have a lot of Pawnee <laughs> objects. We have some we have some good ones, and they've shown up in uh, like in um, an exhibition we did called "A Song for the Horse Nation." Um, yeah. there was a there was a wonderful coat in that uh, in that exhibition, and so we have 
We have a little bit, but but not a lot. So I don't think you'll ever see a Pawnee only exhibition at the NMAI, at, the, at least not one that we develop ourselves. You'll have to do that one, Carlton, and maybe we'll maybe we'll take it in as a traveling exhibition. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> And besides, you know, the you've been you've probably seen the exhibition at the Field Museum, and they they did a nice job with their Pawnee material, and so you know, uh, it's probably not something that that the NMAI will do soon. So earlier this year, I guess uh, I should start by saying back in June of uh, of 2019, uh, the Smithsonian brought aboard its newest uh, secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. Lonnie Bunch who's a historian and the founding director of the National Museum of American of African American History and Culture. And um, he wanted to reorganize uh, things in the central administration. We call the central administration the castle. And uh, sometimes it's an insult and sometimes it's a compliment. So <laughs> he, he, he wanted to reorganize the, the castle and um, take a job that had been being done by a single provost and divide it among three uh, undersecretaries. And so he asked me to, um, to act as the undersecretary for museums and culture uh, for the Smithsonian. And so I'm, I'm at the moment responsible for quite all but one of our museums. The Natural History Museum is actually under the undersecretary for science. But uh, all of the others I, I oversee, along with the Smithsonian Latino Center, the Asian Pacific American Center, the American Women's History Initiative, and uh, something we call uh, Smithsonian Exhibits, uh, as well as the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. So, so that's that's what I do now is, is sort of harass the directors of all of these uh, all of these other units and, and try to keep keep our ducks in a row and have us all marching in the same direction. Very cool. And it sounds like that was a bunch of crap. Um, so on that note, as in the bunch and the reorganization was a bunch of crap, not what Kevin said, because Kevin, <laughs> I was, Kevin I was said, really worried where we were going with that. that. No, uh, <laughs> no, reorganizing government might not work all the time. But on that note, we're going to end this section and we'll meet you on the other side in the fourth section. Uh, welcome back to segment four of episode 38 of the Life and Ruins podcast. We're here with uh, Kevin Gover, the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. And now we're going to talk about the future of indigenous voices in America. And I guess uh, uh, topical news on that, Mr. Gover, I'm curious, what, what's what your thoughts on uh, Biden picking a indigenous, I believe she's Navajo uh, woman to be the secretary of the interior? Uh, I think there's I don't a know if you're allowed uh, to say. Yeah, well, I, I'm, there's a, a, a Pueblo woman who's a member of Congress, uh, Deborah Holland, who's under consideration to be um, uh, Secretary of the Interior. Okay. So, you know, you're going to see, first of all, um, to me, the bigger news is that six natives were elected to Congress in, in this last election, uh, three Democrats and three Republicans. And back in the early 90s, uh, I got involved uh, or got active politically working with the Democratic Party in, in New Mexico. But it was always our hope that more and more people would get involved in, um, in electoral politics, you know, with the parties and, and ultimately as candidates. And that has come true. Uh, there's a Native American woman who's the lieutenant governor in Minnesota. Uh, a recent lieutenant governor in Alaska was, was Native. And so we're beginning to see more and more Native people running for office sure. all over the country. And that, that's a good thing. So it's inevitable that sooner or later uh, there'll be, you know, federal judges and cabinet members who are Native as well. I think it was the, the COVID board, I think is what I was thinking of. Sorry. but yeah. Oh, well, that's yeah. a different thing. So a Navajo woman was, yeah, was appointed to, uh, to the president-elect's uh, COVID advisory committee, I think he's calling it. And that was nice because um, they hit pretty hard. There, there's a tendency in, in 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 D.C. and in New York and in the media centers, L.A., to treat every issue as mostly affecting them, and they forget about uh, the rest of the country all too often. And Indian country is is often the very last thing 
that they think about when they ponder the impacts of some national tragedy like a like a pandemic. And yet Indian country is is really bearing the brunt of this in terms of the the uh, percentage of natives who uh, catch COVID. And certainly on some of the reservations, like the Navajo reservation, the outbreak has been severe and they've had a lot of deaths. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously a good thing when natives should be everywhere. And uh, and I'm glad to see I'm glad to see her on the COVID board. Yeah. So moving forward, I know we talked about this when we were in when D.C., but um, to, just to kind of rehash that again, I no idea when you plan on in retiring. And I remember you telling me that your job when I, I interviewed you for a class once that you, this was the best job you've ever had. But for when you do eventually want to hang up your hat and um, who do you see as the Smithsonian employing as the next director of NMAI? Will it be another indigenous person or another lawyer? I, I'm, I'm all but certain it would be a, an indigenous person. I don't see how really it could, it could uh, credibly be anything else. It would be different if there were no native people who were qualified for a job like this. But, but there are. There are plenty of them. I don't know. You know, museum directors these days aren't uh, cut from the same cloth as they were in the past. You know, they're not, uh, you don't see the, uh, some old, old guy, and I do mean guy, who's worked at the museum forever, becomes a senior curator, and then, be, then ascends to becoming director of the museum. That's not what happens anymore. And so the curious combination of skills required to be a museum director these days um, goes beyond uh, subject matter expertise. In fact, I can I can say, uh, you know, I haven't curated a single exhibit since I became director, and uh, and that's a good thing. You wouldn't want me curating exhibits uh, because we have people who are much better at that than I am. But you do have to have uh, you know some public relations skills. You're you know you're sort of the the face of the museum. You have to raise money. You have to be uh, very nice to very wealthy people. You have to command the respect of the staff, be able to set a strategy and a direction for the museum. You have to have uh, all of the executive skills you would need, you know, in any other uh, undertaking. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a museum person necessarily, but I, I think, and I don't know this, but I think the next director is likely to be more it, it, it w- w- would not be a lawyer, it would be somebody from one of the fields uh, that um, that the NMAI presents, you know, uh, an anthropologist, uh, a Native American studies scholar, an archaeologist, somebody, you know, in a more traditional mode, somebody with a PhD, let's put it that way. Uh, another go- gover, possibly. I don't think people would allow that kind of nepotism <laughs> in DC. <laughs> Carl, Carlton's got some years to put on before uh, before he <laughs> takes on running a museum. Yeah, that's and I need the experience. And as you've been director of NMAI, you've been pretty active in in public outreach in a, in a number of indigenous issues. You know, for one, you have that TED talk on uh, the Columbus Day myth. Which is which is pretty funny. I was rewatching again the other day. Some good jokes in there. And then um, the Washington football team name, which was kind of I, I saw as a surprise over the summer. And your your son, one of the several Phil Govers running around, yeah. was part of Amanda Blackhorse's team on getting that changed. So as you're you know the face of this museum, as as you've said, I guess one is what was the impetus for you in engaging in on in, in this social level. Um, through public outreach, and two, is there kind of any backlash from being the director, but also, you know, calling out Dan Snyder or, or talking about Columbus? So, you know, it, we we really don't do it with an eye toward um, becoming notorious in some way, but the way I think about it is that Americans get their information about Indians from two primary sources, one from the formal education system where Native American history and culture is taught very, very poorly. And the second is from the popular culture, you know, which uh, stereotypes and caricatures Natives in many different ways. So we decided early on that we wanted to confront both of those. And and, uh, we do have a project we call Native Knowledge 360, which is to produce uh, materials for classroom use that tells uh, a better version 
of history, uh, not just Native American history, but history, and is more accurate in its telling of, uh, in its, in its uh, uh, teaching about Native American culture. So we've got a long way to go on that, you know, because there, there, there is no significant American story that cannot be told through Native eyes. And so we want to be able to provide teachers with all that they might need in order to tell any American story through Native eyes. And so we've got a lot of, a lot of building out of that to do. But the, uh, the initial lessons are, are on our website now, and, and uh, they're being used by, by a lot of different teachers. When it comes to the popular culture, you know, we don't confront just the mascots, but also the, the, the stereotyping of natives in television and movies and, and, uh, and on the Internet, frankly. And uh, it just so happens, you know, the most offensive of the Indian mascot teams is right here in River City, Washington, D.C. And they're, they're not just, you know, they, they weren't just wrong. They were obnoxious about being wrong. Uh, and so back in, I think it was 2013, maybe, we did a symposium about mascots. For some reason, it sort of relit the fuse. I mean, people have been active on this issue for decades, but our event really got a lot of media attention, a lot of national media attention, and generated a lot more activism on the subject. And then, you know, let's face it, the, the death of, of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, arising over the summer really forced a lot of American commercial institutions to really think about race in a real way for the first time. And I'm not so naive as to think the ownership of the Washington football team suddenly had a moral awakening. But I, I, I do think that uh, the Native activists don't get enough credit for having pursued a strategy all along of having a negative economic impact on, uh, on the business affairs of that team. You know, FedEx and Nike didn't change their minds all of a sudden either. They also had been pushed by a lot of Native activists to put pressure on the Washington football team. And, uh, and so when they finally did, the dam broke and the team had to give up the name that it had used since the 1930s. So I consider that, though, very much in our wheelhouse. I mean, there are some issues out there that we would never comment on. We're not allowed, for example, to to advocate for particular policies or particular legislation because we're federally funded and you don't use federal dollars to lobby <laughs> to lobby the federal government. But on these sort of cultural issues out there, like uh, matters of repatriation or um, matters of uh, mascotting or any stereotyping of Native people, we feel that we, we, we absolutely have not only uh, the right to speak, but the obligation to speak about it. I guess following that, that was well said, by the way, following that sentiment regarding the Washington football team and, and naming, a question that I often get in my social media following is how, I guess, maybe the PC term would be the, the word, but like, what is the, the proper term to refer to indigenous people as? Cause I've heard it as obviously the American Indian museum, but there's indigenous people, there's native American, and there's also first nations. And I've heard it used interchangeably and it's, it's interesting to see how different people use it. And would you be able to speak to that? Yeah. Well, we use them interchangeably, you know, they're, uh, first of all, I guess I'll, I'll make the point that uh, native people uh, identify themselves primarily by their tribe. So, you know, if I'm, sure. if I'm with a group of Indians somewhere, it's like, Hey, you know, where are you from? I go, yeah, I'm, I'm Pawnee and this guy's a Pueblo and, and uh, she's a Navajo, but there, there probably does need to be some, some way to refer to all of us tribal people collectively, even though we're we're not any one thing. And so I, I really don't care what it is. I think uh, Suzanne Harjo likes to say they're all equally inaccurate, so you can use them interchangeably. <laughs> so, so that's what we do. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, I know in um, 
you know, in the field of archaeology, there's kind of been a, a push. So that's why through the course of this interview, I keep saying indigenous nations. And growing up, I always said Native American, but I know that's kind of like the the term kind of being adopted in, in anthropology is indigenous. Um, and I know First Nations is really a Canadian thing. Yeah. Um, if I'm not, yeah. I'm not. I, I think in the long run, you know, it'll probably be indigenous that takes hold. But you never know, you know, I mean... The, the language changes. And so as long as they're not calling us uh, the R word, I, I could live with the rest of it. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. And, and kind of wrapping up this, this interview, what advice would you give to young indigenous peoples right now, whether they be pursuing careers in anthropology, museum studies, American Indian studies, or, or law um, as someone who's kind of watched these, paradigm shifts in in indigenous culture and perspectives from you know the 70s to today first of all obviously and and in a, and and I don't mean to be old fashioned but work hard you know i i always thought that native american lawyers won because we worked harder we cared more than our adversaries and so david slew goliath quite regularly in in the field of indian law for a long time the second is um, to be humble. And, and by that, I mean, you know, don't ever think you know it all, because the older you get and the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. I was fortunate to learn that relatively early in my career. Now, the year after I graduated from law school, of course, I knew everything. But after that, I began to realize how much I didn't know. And, uh, and that, was, that was a really valuable learning experience. The third is, um, you know, you can make a plan for your career if you want, but, um, you know, by the time you've been out of school for five years, your plan will have blown up uh, because you can't anticipate what's going to be out there. And so you have to be flexible about what you're going to do next. I would have never imagined a career or a, a tenure as a museum director, let alone a Smithsonian Museum. But that's what happened, and, and, I, and I think I've done a good job at it. You know, I, I, I had uh, the right set of skills to do it well. If I had closed my mind to that and thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I can only do law stuff. I would have missed the greatest opportunity of my life, uh, which is to work at the Smithsonian and to work at the NMAI. You have to be humble enough to realize that you don't know everything and you can't anticipate everything, and you need to just uh, respond in the moment. You know, one of the things I, I like to say, Carlton, if people ask me what's the secret to my success, I say, luck. I've had good luck. And, um, and I don't mean to be self-deprecating by that. I think I'm a smart guy. I know that I work hard. But there are a lot of smart guys out there and a lot of folks who work hard who just didn't have the same opportunities and, and, and good luck that I've had. So... On, on the other hand, I still wouldn't have succeeded for all of my luck if I hadn't worked hard. So, you know, I, I'm not going to be so silly as to say you make your own luck because I don't think that's always true. I know too many people who, who've who been left behind who were extremely talented but just, just couldn't catch a break for whatever reason. But I do know you're, you're more likely to get lucky if you do work hard and, and really strive to be um, one of the best at whatever you do. And, and I really mean that about whatever you do. I, I don't think uh, a museum director is any better than a bus driver. What's important is that you do whatever it is you do as well as you possibly can. Nobody gets it perfect, but if you, uh, if you strive to be as good as you can be, you know, you're going to be a success at whatever you do. So all you young folks, there's, there's a whole world out there that's, that's going to belong to you. And uh, don't expect anyone to just hand it over to you. You're going to have to work for it. And you might even have to knock a few of us old guys around and get to move us out of there. But, uh, but your time will come. It's, it's super hard to follow that statement because it was, it was beautiful and, and, and very articulate. And, you know, we want to thank you for, for being on this podcast and because this this podcast is kind of a we talk about the the retrospective where you have come from and where you are now we usually ask this question would you choose to live a life in ruins but i think you've transcended that and have lived a life on 
the forefront of um, indigenous issues and have worked with indigenous folks around the north uh, around North America and everywhere to help amplify those voices. If you had the opportunity, would you would you choose to do that again? Would you change anything? No, hell no. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything that's happened to me, good and bad, brought me to where I am, and I kind of I, I like where I am. So why change anything? And, and let me just add that um, that it's a privilege to work with these communities. You can't spend much time around them without um, without developing just really powerful feelings for them and, and a desire to uh, help them do what they want to do. And so uh, the pleasure has been been all mine in this work and and it's um i found it just incredibly rewarding you know i always hear this nonsense that people would say that well running the bia is a thankless job it wasn't thankless at all um there were so many people who just you know were were thanking me and and praying for me and praising me for for trying to do it right it was just uh, it's just been it's just been really rewarding i i couldn't have asked for a better life Well, all right. And on that note, everyone, we just interviewed Kevin Gover, who is currently the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and acting undersecretary for museums and culture. Um, Thank you so much, Kevin, for being with us tonight. It was an honor to have you on. And I mean that in the sincerest uh, manner. Well, you're welcome. It was a pleasure being here, Colin. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. Continuing the trend of dad jokes. Uh, this is a, a list sent to my from my father, Dean Johnnan. So this is dad jokes from my dad. So uh, gentlemen here, which days are the strongest? Mm-hmm. I, I have no idea. Yeah. Saturday and Sunday. The rest are just weekdays. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yep. That's pretty good. That, pretty clever. That, 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 that took me a second. I was that took me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean Johnnan. All right. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.